Hi there, I'm Adam. I'm one of the Associate Pastors here at G2. Last week, we began our new Ancient Ways series, looking at the cave, a place of grounding, of self-recovery and God-discovery that has so much relevance to the situation we find ourselves in today. And now we're going to turn our attention to somewhere that I think has as much relevance to us in the midst of this pandemic, the table. The table is a place where stories are told, where people are welcomed and included as they are. It's a place where community is built. The table is the great equaliser, but all the same sat round it. And it's a place of hospitality, of conversation, healing and reconciliation. And in the Bible, we read in the Gospels, the accounts of uh, Jesus' life here on earth, that he spent so much of his time sat at a table just like this one, eating with people, sharing grace, community, hope mission, salvation and promise. And today we're going to look at one of these occasions uh, in the Bible. We're going to look at uh, Luke 19, 1 to 10 and the story of uh, Zacchaeus. Let's get into it, shall we? I'm reading from the NIV uh, Bible translation, but feel free to use whichever one you prefer and you can read along on the screen as well. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector And was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anybody out of anything I will pay back four times that amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. This beautiful story of repentance, of salvation, uh, takes place in Jericho, a city of great prosperity and wealth. Uh, And the writer of this account, uh, Luke, begins introducing us to this character, Zacchaeus. He's described first and foremost as the chief tax collector, someone who's wealthy. And just to clock here, we know that being a tax collector at that point in time, it wasn't a particularly glamorous job. It wasn't very well paid and so uh, tax collectors took it upon themselves to make extra profit through charging above and beyond the normal taxes required and keeping a bit for themselves. As you might have guessed, they weren't very popular people. And so for Zacchaeus to be described as rich, for that to be the second thing that we hear about him, we've got to know that he's engaging in some rather unsavoury business dealings. He's also described as a short man. In that time, putting him at a natural physical disadvantage when it came to seeing Jesus. And yet we hear of him being so desperate to seek after Jesus. And we can picture him climbing up this tree, uh, leaning and jostling to get the best view possible, all while being jeered and mocked by this crowd who was no doubt filled with people that he cheated and tricked in order to make a quick buck. You can imagine the crowd laughing and pointing at this well-dressed little fraudster clambering up into an old tree like a little boy, his cloak tearing and catches on the old branches here and there. And then Jesus enters the story. He sees this man, the controversial and despised traitor, who fleeced his own people in order to pay the evil and greedy Roman Empire and took a cut for himself. And how does Jesus respond? Does he look at Zacchaeus? Does he feel with rage at his greedy motives and his dodgy business practices? Does he scold him for his unjust actions and corrupt heart? No. He sees him and he calls him by his name. He knows Zacchaeus. He lays a claim on him. In John 10 uh, verse 3, we read of Jesus, the good shepherd, saying that he always calls his sheep by their name. And Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down from your tree. Let me into your home. Open yourself up to me. And share your food, your story your time with me. He doesn't preach as a case. He doesn't lead with a rebuking heart, calling him to repent or perish. No, 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 no. Jesus desired relationship. He desired time with Zacchaeus, sat at the table. 
And Zacchaeus responded with gladness and joy. He welcomed Jesus into his home. He trusted that this man he would have no doubt heard so much about was good and wanted to get to know him. Uh, Charles Spurgeon writes that Christ will never force himself into a man's house. He will never sit there against a man's will. That would not be the action of a guest, but of an unwelcome intruder. Jesus is deliberate. He's intentional. He's loving to Zacchaeus, just as he is to us today. But yet in this passage, we see how all of the people began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. You can picture them muttering and murmuring and firing out condemning Facebook messages and sneaky Snapchats of this short, corrupt agent of the oppressive empire walking off with this Jesus fella. Can't believe what we just saw downtown. Perhaps not. But be assured that this crowd responded to Jesus' actions here with as much outrage as they did to the controversial tax collector Zacchaeus. And then we don't get in this short passage, we don't get to see the uh, full ins and outs of Zacchaeus' time with Jesus. We don't know what was on the menu. We don't know if Jesus and his disciples mucked in with the washing up uh, or helped clear away the plates. Uh, we don't know how the disciples handled an awkward conversation with this enemy of the people that they would have not been a fan of. But what we do see here in this passage is so important. We see repentance. We see Zacchaeus turning away from evil and greedy habits, rejecting the old normal that had brought him so much material wealth and promised so much, and yet left Zacchaeus seeking after the one person he knew would bring him real life and purpose. And then Zacchaeus gives back generously, above and beyond what he'd taken before. He accounted for his previous wrongdoing and demonstrates this heart of generosity that can only come when people have been transformed by the living hope and power of the gospel of Jesus. And then Jesus responds by addressing the crowd as well as the case. He restores the status of this man. He addressed the mumblers and grumblers and says that salvation has come to this fellow son of Abraham, one of your people. See, all things are possible with God. A rich man can be saved. And then our story ends with this powerful one-liner explaining the whole thing. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's exactly why Jesus extended the hand of friendship to this notorious sinner, Zacchaeus. Jesus came precisely to save people like Zacchaeus, to seek and save the lost. And you see, even though Zacchaeus sought Jesus, it turns out that he was the one who was lost. And it was really Jesus who sought after him. And we realise in this passage that Zacchaeus' search for Jesus turned out to be the whole reason that Jesus was there. The reason that Jesus stopped in his tracks, looked up at this man clinging on a tree branch and brought him hope, freedom and life. Jesus seeks after the lost, the hurting, the hopeless, the broken and the battered. And where does that happen? At the table. The table, that place of hospitality, a word which Greek, uh, Greek root means love of the stranger, and that place of healing and openness, where we see strangers become neighbours, we see neighbours become the family of God, just like with Zacchaeus. Where we see at the table all people treated like the image bearers of God that they are, where just like Jesus with Zacchaeus, we see people as good, regardless of their life decisions and their life histories, and we invite them into taste of the holy glory of God, to come and know a living hope that is only found in Jesus, our friend and saviour. And you know what, we've seen this happen time and time again uh, in the history of G2. I can think of countless strangers who became neighbours, who became family with us, uh, through life shared at ta creaky tables in dingy university flats, who realised the truth of Jesus cramped into front rooms and sofas and floors, and were able to ask questions openly and honestly alongside fellow inquisitive people in a group called Table, alongside G2 strangers who became their neighbours and in time their family. And the table itself is not the solution. There's nothing magical about a piece of wood nailed to four legs, is there? But the table is a place that we bring church to people. And people, uh, all of us, we long for belonging, don't we? And we seek it in workplaces, in, in nightclubs, in sports teams, in societies, in clubs, in friendships, and wherever else. And if the church isn't the one showing people real hospitality, 
They'll find it in well-meaning and well-intended places that might bring them identity, might bring them friendship, but ultimately will never offer the ultimate promise of salvation and life in all its fullness that comes through Jesus. Throughout generations upon generations of church history, ordinary, everyday people like you and me sit at the table with one another and know we're welcomed. We sit alongside people and we take their hand and we follow Jesus together, trusting him to lead us into goodness and glory. And we need to know that in this era of isolation, this pandemic is waking us up to the reality of our need for the table. The poet John Don wrote in 1624, that as sickness is the greatest misery, so the greatest misery of sickness is unwanted solitude. We all know that our world was lonely before it locked us in our homes. We all know that our world felt isolated and outcast before it told us to stand two metres apart from one another. We all know that at times our world felt scary and overwhelming before the dark spectre of a mysterious illness crept across the globe. And in this world of fear, of isolation and loneliness, our tables remain open. Jesus remains present. He still seeks to save the lost. And maybe in this world, in this moment, we don't share meals and we don't team up on the washing up, but perhaps our guests join us virtually. Perhaps we see them on a screen rather than at the table next to us. Perhaps our guests still laugh with us, share with us and play with us. Or maybe perhaps at our tables we remember those that we want to have round but no longer can. Maybe, maybe we pray for the people that we couldn't invite in. See, this is a time where the table takes on a different meaning, but its value remains stronger than ever. This is the time where we reach out to the stranger who might become a neighbour and who might become the family of God. This is a time to call, to Skype, to FaceTime, to Zoom, to Facebook message, to Instagram, to write, to email, to message, to join our tables to one another from afar. This is a time to press in. And I'd absolutely love you uh, to join with a G2 group if you're not yet in one, to be part of a small community of people who are praying alongside you, enduring isolation alongside you from afar, sharing their stories and keeping their hope with you. Uh, in these next few weeks, we're going to be starting up a whole new number of groups to help you find a home and keep the hope around the table. And we want everyone in G2 and beyond to have this opportunity to know this kind of community. You see, we read in uh, 1 Peter 5 uh, that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And you see, what's interesting about lions is lions don't take out a whole pack of animals. They seek out those who are alone. They seek out the weakest and they seek out those who are lost. And I've seen this at work in this current pandemic. Uh, in the last week, there's been a 12% rise in global porn use. Our enemy prowls like a roaring lion. He lurks in the isolation and the darkness and he exploits our every vulnerability. But Jesus calls us into family and into the light. And you see G2 uh, being part of this hope filled community is not just something to pick us up and put a smile on our face every now and then. This is a place to find love and welcome in the very real spiritual battle that we're going to find ourselves in at some point in the next few months. And our tables need not be places of hiding and isolation, but they can be outposts to reach out to the lonely and the fearful, to show the love of Jesus to the lost and searching Zacchaeuses. At this time of physical isolation and social distancing, let's open up our tables for opening up our phones, our inboxes, our schedules. Let's reach out and welcome those, not physically around us, but still in our lives, the strangers who become neighbours, who become the family of God. At this time where our world is at its quietest, where our streets are empty and still, the inescapable and undeniable call to the table that we have as followers of Jesus has never been louder. And as we end, let me leave you with a question. Who is your Zacchaeus waiting in the tree? Who is it that this time at this moment, you need to see, you need to call out by name and treat with dignity, compassion and love, just like Jesus did.